Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, it's very nice to, to be here and to see many old friends. It's a little hard to follow uh, Chaz Freeman. I think he has the effect of sounding so authoritative and so pessimistic that it's hard to know what to say next. Um, I'm not going to try to cheer you up and say he's all wrong and that we really have brilliant ideas that can transform the Middle East. Obviously, the Middle East is, is uh, going through um, a lot of turmoil. It's going to be very difficult for any of us to uh, see um, how things will, will sort themselves out. Uh, in terms of the topic of grand strategy, I must confess at the outset that I'm rather suspicious of grand strategies for the Middle East, especially at times like this when so many balls are up in the air. Uh, it strikes me that in the past two decades in particular, we have had two broad approaches, quite different broad approaches to the region. Perhaps one can dignify them as grand strategies if you want to do so. Uh, the first was the first President Bush and the Clinton approach from Madrid through, let's say, Camp David from about 1991 uh, to 2000. And the key elements of that approach, it seems to me, and maybe it was a grand strategy, were to try to keep Iran and Iraq more or less contained. This was the so-called dual containment policy that was enunciated early in the Clinton period. And the the point of that, of course, was to keep the Gulf region relatively stable and relatively quiet uh, while we tried to forge some kind of an international consensus behind a comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace, which was the point of the Madrid conference and its continuity uh, through the subsequent decade. Had this approach succeeded, <clears throat> and I think there was a moment in perhaps 1993 to 95 when it seemed possible, it might very well have helped to stabilize a relatively moderate pro-American political order in the Arab-Israeli region while keeping Iran and Iraq from too much mischief making. But it failed, and it failed quite spectacularly in 2000, in Clinton's last year. And that failure combined with the emergence in the mid-1990s of an alternative grand strategy. Think of the clean break document that was written uh, as a memo to Benjamin Netanyahu, you should remember, in 1996. Um, that plus the second President Bush's ABC policy, anything but Clinton, uh, meant that the approach to the region, particularly after the 9-11 attacks, set the stage for a real fundamental transformation in the American approach to, uh, the, over, uh, to the region generally. Uh, this was an attempt to remake uh, the Middle East that was as ambitious as anything that was, uh, had been envisaged since the British uh, set out to remake the Middle East in the 1920s. The centerpiece of the Bush strategy, Bush II strategy, uh, turned out to be Iraq. But Iraq was, of course, never meant to turn out the way it did. It was not supposed to be such a big, expensive, and ultimately flawed experiment. Instead, Iraq was to be an example of a clean, quick use of force to change an admittedly dreadful regime that we would then, and then we would turn things over to pro-Western moderates, always in search of those, uh, in this case, Ahmed Shalabi, who would become model Democrats, or at least not as bad as Saddam Hussein, would make peace with Israel. Remember the road to Jerusalem passes through Baghdad article? That was a real winner. <laughs> Uh, and uh, this grateful Iraq would provide U.S., the United States, with military bases with which we could uh, help to balance Iranian power. And meanwhile, it would set a uh, model for change uh, plus democracy elsewhere in the region. Iraq was not meant to be the end of this very ambitious project. Uh, I traveled frequently to the region during this period, and I was rather stunned to find some of my uh, democratic friends in the Arab world really hoping that it might work because everybody had a favorite dictator that they wanted to sp see shoved aside by muscular Americans. And of course it just didn't work out. The Bush moment in the Middle East, uh, like the earlier British moment, although the British moment lasted much longer, came and went without leaving much behind in terms of the hoped for result of a stable, democratic, pro-Western political order 
and this after spending an unprecedented amount of taxpayers' money, at least a trillion dollars, and thousands of American lives and untold numbers of Iraqi lives. Iraq today is hardly a model for anyone. U.S. influence there is less than Iran's. The modern democratic order is nowhere in sight. Political Islam is stronger than ever. And of course, the Arab-Israeli conflict is still with us. Yes, Saddam and bin Laden are gone. Uh, but the Middle East is in turmoil. The price of oil is over $100 a barrel compared to a quarter of that price in the 1990s. And the American public is thoroughly disillusioned with big schemes for fixing the region. As Bob Gates, our former Secretary of Defense, said when he left the Pentagon, if his successor were to think of sending troops to the Middle East, he should have his head examined. But there are voices, uh, some quite loud right now, that do want to send troops or arms or bombs or drones or something to fix the problems, for example, of Syria and Iran. So far, President Obama has resisted the temptation, and it looks as if his new choices for Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense, if they get confirmed, will reinforce and perhaps reflect his cautious stance. But caution is not a policy. It's at best an attitude. Uh, just as belligerent liberal or neoconservative interventionism are not policies, they're more frames of mind. So is there a sensible grand strategy or at least a comprehensive well-considered approach that makes sense for today's Middle East? And if so, if so, I believe it resides in a realistic appreciation of what American national interests are. And it must start with the understanding that we're not all powerful. This was the great illusion of the 1990s and the first decade of, of this century. Uh, look at the size of our budget deficit and look at the inevitable cuts in military spending that lie ahead. So whatever we set out to do in the Middle East and elsewhere, we're going to have to think about doing it in cooperation with at least some other parties, some to help pay the bills and some to add their political influence to our waning political influence. In short, we're going to have to discover or rediscover some of the classical maxims of multilateral diplomacy. Think more of balancing than of winning. Think more of persuasion than of diktat. With these precepts in mind, I would start to design a basic approach to the region with several key points uh, to consider. The first one, I think it is well time to overcome the long U.S.-Iran estrangement. Some form of diplomatic rapprochement is needed in the coming years. The elements of a deal on nuclear capabilities are visible, if not quite in place, but they need to be part of a larger package. Since we cannot negotiate this very well in public, given our own domestic public opinion, the new Secretary of State should find a reliable channel to Iran's top leadership and start his own assessment of how to forge a new relationship. Uh, this is, as I said, not going to be easy, but it is certainly important. Uh, if we could succeed, the benefits would be seen in places such as Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and the Gulf region. And we would avoid being pressured into what could turn out to be an extremely dangerous war, uh, which is lurking on the horizon. Chaz Freeman was involved in the Nixon opening to China, which was one of the great uh, acts of strategic uh, farsightedness. Uh, I think a, a not as big a move, but a comparably audacious uh, move toward a, an improved U.S.-Iran relationship would also serve our interests well. Second point for looking ahead, uh, keep close to Turkey. Uh, I slightly disagree with Chaz about the quality of the U.S.-Turkish relationship today. I think this is an area where President Obama has actually done fairly well so far. The United States and Turkey on a wide range of issues have been more cooperative than they have been competitive. Obviously, uh, it's important to try to keep this relationship on track. It has a lot to do with uh, what will uh, eventually unfold in places like Syria uh, and Iraq. And to an impressive degree, Turkey is something of a model to be emulated in the region. Its political and economic reforms have been essentially successful, uh, and Turkey has played an interesting and impressive and independent role in the region, which I think we should be glad of. 
It's a voice on the whole for reason. It's also a reliable NATO ally, at least so far. The third country that I think we need to pay a lot of attention to, and this is not particularly new or original, but it is Egypt. Uh, Egypt we have taken for granted for a long period of time when Sadat and Mubarak were president, and we can no longer do that. Uh, Egypt is going through a transformation. We don't know where it's all going to end up, but the U.S.-Egyptian relationship remains an important one. Uh, we uh, have to think of new ways of dealing with a new Egypt, with a new Egyptian uh, leadership, and it's going to take some real uh, constant uh, tension and effort. You've probably seen the, uh, the unpleasant press stories in the last few days that are designed to demonize uh, President Morsi, and indeed he seems to have said some fairly dreadful things, but you can expect uh, doubts to be raised about the importance of this relationship as Egypt uh, consolidates its Islamist uh, uh, credentials. Uh, but Egypt remains important. It remains important for what happens uh, in the Arab-Israeli arena. Uh, it is geostrategically important. And if you think of the Middle East as a region with several large uh, players in the regional uh, game of politics, Egypt is certainly going to be one of those. So what about Saudi Arabia, Israel, Palestine, and Syria? These are, after all, uh, the countries that generate a lot of the headlines about the Middle East. Uh, I won't say much about Saudi Arabia. I think Chaz has said uh, <clears throat> what needs to be said. But I think we also need to recognize that Saudi Arabia is almost certainly going to be passing through a generational transition that will be quite complicated for them in the coming decade. Uh, we will have very little to say about how that plays itself out. I saw someone from Winnip recently writing that the United States should choose the next king of Saudi Arabia. I cannot think of a stupider thing to try to do. Uh, we'll almost certainly get it wrong were we to try, and whoever we might try to anoint would almost certainly lose legitimacy overnight. During this period of transition in Saudi Arabia, which is inevitable simply because of the age of its leaders, uh, we shouldn't ask too much of the Saudis. The Saudis cannot uh, be asked to you know, uh, be at the cutting edge of any big diplomatic initiatives. They are going to be looking inward to consolidating uh, their power during a difficult period. By the same token, we have no reason to make the process any more difficult for them than it's already going to be. Let me say a word about Syria. Uh, Syria is a terrible tragedy. I'm not sure it had to turn out as badly as it has so far, but it is certainly a situation that we cannot fix on our own. The Assad regime almost certainly cannot restore its power, but at the same time, the opposition is not poised for a clear-cut early victory. The alternative to an even worse civil war than we have seen to date could be a political deal of some sort. This seems to be the faint hope that Lakhdar Brahimi is pursuing, and I think we should wish him well and try to work with the Russians and others to bring both sides of the conflict to accept the need for an early ceasefire and a negotiated transition. It's not going to be easy. Uh, people on both sides, or more than two sides by now, still think they can, quote, win. Uh, but ultimately, I think the important thing is for the fighting to stop and for inducements to be uh, created from all of those who wish Syria well uh, for the country to seek a broad reconciliation. As I said, not an easy task, but an important one. And what about Israel-Palestine? Well, I'm just about as pessimistic as Chaz, but maybe not quite. Uh, we can't pretend the conflict no longer matters just because we're tired of it, which I think many of us are. Uh, it has the potential, as the recent Gaza crisis showed, to flare up and risk spreading. The new conventional wisdom seems to be that the two-state approach is dead. Maybe it is. Uh, but it was never really seriously tried, in all honesty. Uh, Clinton, in December of 2000, broached an imperfect outline of what a two-state solution might look like. And a few years later, uh, Prime Minister Olmert and uh, Palestinian Authority leader uh, Abu Mazen Mahmoud Abbas pushed the model a bit further in 2008. Uh, and when they needed help to bring it to a successful conclusion uh, and turn to the United States, they got no help whatsoever. 
So we have been at a dead end since about 2008. The current Israeli government seems uninterested. The Palestinians are divided. But I still think that Secretary Kerry, assuming he will be our new Secretary of State, owes it to himself to do due diligence on this issue. You can't pretend the issue has, is, can be ignored. Um, and he needs to at least engage seriously uh, in early uh, days of his, his uh, uh, tenure uh, in serious talks with all of the parties interested. Um, and a, he certainly should not waste his time, the President must know this by now, in trying to somehow engage in confidence building measures. We have been through a decade and a half of the pursuit of tiny little steps to build confidence between Israelis and Palestinians, and it simply doesn't work. Uh, it is also futile to simply say, let's get the parties back to the negotiating table, as if that by itself will provide some magic in the absence of a pr uh, prior agreement on the broad uh, outlines of what a negotiation would all be about. So when the Obama administration essentially dropped uh, its efforts at Israeli-Palestinian diplomacy, which happened quite dramatically and embarrassingly in mid-2011 when Bibi Netanyahu came to the United States and got 29 standing ovations in front of a joint session of Congress, we ended with a fairly weak statement of what we thought uh, an Arab-Israeli-Palestinian agreement might look like. Uh, I think it might well be time for us and partners in the international arena to revisit the issue of what we could be prepared to support, to state it clearly, uh, and to allow the parties in the region to start debating again whether it is worth trying to pursue that kind of an outcome or whether we really do have to think quite fundamentally about a Middle East in, without the prospect of, of peace between Israel and its remaining Arab neighbors. <clears throat> Oddly enough, some people argue that we shouldn't bother with the Israeli-Palestinian initiative because the conflict is too hard to solve. Well, yes, of course it's hard. If it were easy, it would have been solved long ago. But often this is said by the same people who urge intervention in Syria uh, or in Iran. Now, my view is that these latter cases are much more difficult and much more risky and likely to be much more costly than tackling the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We know, broadly speaking, what the contours are of Israeli-Palestinian diplomacy. Yes, it's tough, but I don't think it's impossible. It's just an act of extreme political will, uh, which is hard to mobilize here. It's hard to mobilize uh, anywhere. It takes energy and effort by sophisticated and tenacious diplomats, but otherwise it doesn't entail big costs or risks, and if we try and fail, it's not the end of the world. If by chance we were to succeed, which I think is unlikely, the benefits would actually be quite substantial. So I would keep Israeli-Palestinian peace as part of what a sensible strategy for the new Middle East uh, should be, without illusions, but I don't think we can abandon our interest and concern with it. But as I mentioned, I think it should be part of a broader approach that places priority on the big three countries of Iran, Turkey, and Egypt. Thank you.